Wigwoman, Wamiski Tompak, Natiwis Patakamawasos. Uh, welcome, thank you, friends, family, all my relations uh, for having me here. Uh, they call me uh, Thunder Bear. Uh, that's what Natiwis means. In our culture, in most native cultures, it's not I call myself, it's not my name is, is they call me. As we are born, we are given names. And now we don't have names like Paul or Zach or Jessica. Um, we have names after plants, trees, animals, because that's what's in the wilderness. We didn't have made up, I'm not calling them made up names, but we didn't have these European style of names. So we named each other or elders would name us as we're born from things in the wild because it was the only really vocabulary we had. So whenever we refer to ourselves, we always say, they call me. So my name is David Eichelberg. I'm the Outreach and Tradition Specialist from the Mohegan Tribe. I would like to say, I'm going to say all this now um, because I'm silly and I left my business cards and our Tanaquijan Museum pamphlets at a school on Tuesday. And I have not been able to get them back yet. I haven't had time to go over there. So I do want to say, if you are an educator or if you're part of another group that might be interested in having me speak, um, I'd be more than happy. Feel free to reach out to Kelly. Um, usually I can hand out my cards and, and our pamphlets about the museum, um, but sadly I just do not have them tonight. So I work at the Tanaquijan Museum in Uncasville, Connecticut. Who here has visited the Tanaquijan Museum? Anyone yet? Oh, some hands, nice. So you might be familiar with kind of how we operate and what we have available over there. We're a very small museum built in 1931. So we just had our 90th anniversary not too long ago. Very small museum, just three small rooms, but is jam packed with old ancient artifacts. Some are 40 years old, some are 400 years old. So it's a, a wide variety. Luckily, one of my three times great grandfather, his regalia is in that museum. Some of you may have heard of him at a young age called Lemuel Fielding, or what we call Chief Occam. He was chief from 1903 to 1928. He was the first outreach specialist of the Mohegan tribe, where he was traveling to Hartford to work with groups that he, he worked with out there to teach high schoolers, to teach middle schoolers in that kind of age range. So I like to think it runs in the family because my dad not too long ago was also uh, doing this job of going to schools, going to groups just like this and teaching about culture and history. Now, a long time ago, we didn't have the funding before the tribe was able to get federal recognition and we had the, uh, the casino and all of our current ventures, we didn't have a lot of money. So a lot of this was volunteer. Up until the mid 2000s and 2010, this was mainly volunteer work by tribal members. Luckily now we are able to have full-time uh, full staff like myself that can go from area to area all over the state of Connecticut and a little bit of Rhode Island and present about our culture. So I have a lot to talk about today, a lot of teaching, um, a lot of drum playing as well. Um, so I am gonna try to fit in as much as I can. I can, I will take questions at the end. So if you have any questions for me or about Native American uh, ideology in general, feel free to raise your hand at the end and I will be able to do that. And then also, if you do have lingering comments, I can hang out at this table up here to answer any further questions after the night is over. So I want to start off this night with a gathering song. I want to play a gathering song for you. This song would be played as people start entering a, um, a ceremony, maybe an event. We have our winter social coming up for tribal members, not only Mohegan, but other local tribal members as well, where we get to eat some traditional food. We get to dance traditional songs and play our drum music, kind of like a miniature powwow. Um, so this song would be played as people start to enter. <clears throat> Wami skidum pak yo tapi yo iyo ma hexeno ma we a yo tai wami we a yo we a yo nanu yo tapi yo iyo ma wamo chi wam 
Panayo o guochuk, yo tapi o papi quato, o kunas yo tapi o yo amau mochi. Wampanayo o guochuk, yo tapi o papi quato. We ha we ha we ha ya we ha we ha ya. We ha ya yo we. We ha we ha we ha ya. We ha we ha ya. We ha ya yo we. Wami skidum pak yo tapio yo mahik senu. Maui ya yo Taiwami we ha yo. Nanu yo tapio, yo a mau mochi. Wampana yo o guochuk, yo tapio papi quato. O kunas yo tapio, yo a mau mochi. Wampana yo o guochuk. Yo tapi yo papi quato. We ha we ha we ha ya. We ha we ha ya. We ha ya yo we. We ha we ha we ha ya. We ha we ha ya. We ha ya yo we. All right. Thank you very much. Make sure that's not going to play music. So, does anyone here have any familiarity with the Mohegan tribe uh, going to powwows? Maybe you met Gladys Tanaquidgen at one point in your life. Anyone? Couple hands. All right. So, a lot of times when I do uh, adult groups, because the fourth graders have no idea who I'm talking about. Um, but a lot of people, when I do adult groups like this, they may have had interactions with some of our great leaders of the past. Uh, Gladys Tanaquidgen was our medicine woman for about 60 years. She was born in 1899 and she passed away in 2005. Uh, so she lived to 106 years old. Now, if you've been to our museum, you would see that her house is right next door to the museum. So even as a even five or six year old little boy, going and visiting the museum, I could still see her come out of her house and even offer a tour or offer us some wisdom, uh, which was pretty awesome to see such a, a graceful woman at that age uh, still be able to uh, teach and offer uh, her wisdom to the next generation. But I have a lot to talk about, so I want to talk to you about our ancient history and how we came here to this area. A long time ago, we lived in the Delaware, New Jersey area, um, right where there's a giant uh, uh, water cove uh, in between the uh, southern New Jersey and the eastern part of Delaware. That is where the Lene Lenape tribal nation uh, is the middle of their tribal nation, and then they have clans and groups kind of spaced out in all the way up until uh, Connecticut, a little bit in New York, and most of New Jersey and Delaware. They were one of the largest tribal nations at the time, and we believe this is before the year 1000. Uh, we can't really be certain. So what happens is we are the wolf clan of the Lene Lenape Nation, our people today. And what happens is we kind of want to create our own identity. So we go ahead and pick up what we can bring with us, and we get on the road and start to travel. We head all the way to upper state New York, up by the Great Lakes, the two Great Lakes in that... Uh, northwestern corner of the state. And we're living there for a while, living off the lakes, living off the hunting ground, but it starts to get a little packed with other tribal nations, and the lakes just aren't per, uh, producing as much food as the ocean does for us. Uh, so we wanted to kind of move again as we were a um, nomadic people, most tribal nations were. And so we picked up and moved again and does anyone know where we landed after that? 
It's kind of an easy answer if you think of what town we're in right now. So we landed in the area of Stonington and Ledger, right kind of on that border there. So right down the street from where we are today. And so we land here, we still don't know the time period, but we believe it's somewhere around the 13 or 1400s. And so we're thriving here. We're living as the Pequot tribal nation in Stonington, Connecticut. And we're going well, we're, you know, we haven't seen any Europeans yet. And then in the early 1600s to 1620s, we start to see different groups of people land here. Um, we believe that in ancient times, in the years, you know, as early as 1000 or even earlier, that many European groups have landed here at some point or another. The Vikings, uh, the Dutch, the, we believe even Asian uh, countries landed on the West Coast, even much earlier before that. But again, there's no history books from the Native Americans. So we fast forward a couple hundred years, all the way to 1633. This is the heights of the English landing on the shores of Connecticut and Rhode Island. So this is when the Pequot people first see the ships landing here. We believe they are giant wooden birds. Now, I don't know why we thought they were wooden birds, because we know birds are not made out of wood. Uh, but that is what the, how the story goes. They saw giant wooden birds because they thought the giant sails on the ships were the wings. And we said that they were floating across the water. And we were obviously scared. Our men, our women were, were scared. We had no idea what they were. But then once the ships landed and they saw all these little men come off the boat, we realized it must be some kind of transport. So as the English start to land in full force, they're trying to build villages, they want to know who we are, we're trying to live a productive uh, lifestyle together. The chief of our Pequot nation, Sassacus, wants to defend his land and wants to um, be enemies against the English. And this is where a wise man named Uncas comes into play. Uncas wants to befriend the English. He wants to learn from them. He wants to work with them because he knew he was outmanned. He was outgunned. Uh, they had, the English had metal. We'd never seen metal before. They had muskets. We had bows and arrows. So we realized there was a huge disadvantage. So Uncas wanted to be friends with him. So he goes to his cousin Sassicus and say, I'm going to take those loyal to me and I'm going to create my own tribal nation. So he takes his loyal followers across, back across the Thames River, and we end up in Uncasville, which is the birth spot of our Fort Shantock, our first village in this area, which a long time ago was Uncas's grandfather's hunting grounds. So as Uncas's grandfather was living in the Pequot village, he had his own special hunting grounds at Fort Shantock, which is why Uncas chose that safe spot. So we open up our first village in 1633 is when we became our own tribal nation. Um, but that's due to Uncas taking his, as the record books say, couple hundred warriors. Who knows how many women, how many children join him. But we create this tribal nation of Mohegan. So we are almost to our 400 year mark of being our own recognized tribe. And now in modern day, some of you may know, but in 1994, we were, elect, we were awarded federal recognition for the Mohegan people, which gave us the title of saying, we are, you are officially a, a, you know, a recognized tribe, you get to follow reservation rules, you get to have all the rights of a federally recognized tribe, which thankfully allowed us to build a casino, which then further allowed us to make jobs for local people, which allowed us to donate, because now we actually have the money to donate to all these groups that we've wanted to for so long. And then we also bring a lot of revenue into the state. So whatever your preference or whatever your moral vision of a casino is, that is not me to tell you what you should think. Because um, I know there are good things and bad things about casino. 
but the money that comes in allows us to fund all the programs we need to fund, which is amazing for us. So I have a lot of things I have to show you here, and I'm sure people are always asking what's what, but I will not have time to go through everything. So a brief little break in between my history lessons here. I have a deer skin here for you. This is a nice little deer skin. I don't know where it came from. It was given to me when I started this job that I could use as a little bit of a show and tell piece. So this is what we'd use as our clothing. We would be able to take what we hunted and skin the animal and tan the animal to get this final piece here that we can use as our clothing. Just like what I'm wearing for you today on the lower half of my body. I'm wearing what we call leggings and a breech cloth. Leggings are very similar to cowboy chaps. They are worn around the legs to protect yourselves from the wilderness, from running through the woods, from maybe an animal attacking you. Hopefully it's a small one and not a bear because a bear claw would rip right through this. But that was our traditional style of clothing because that's all we had. We didn't have a Kohl's to go to or a Walmart or American Eagle. So we had to make our own clothing with what the earth gave us. Not only would we use their skins and their leathers, but we'd use all the pieces of the deer. We were a very environmentally and respectful group of people to our creator and to the environment. So our, oh, always our purpose was to give back to the earth every time we took from the earth. So when we went and hunted, when we cut down a tree, when we took our crops out of our gardens, we'd always give an offering of tobacco or sweet grass or even flat cedar as an offering to our creator saying, thank you for giving us what we need to survive. And here is an offering so that you keep giving us these pieces. Because we would know, or in our lore, if we gave that offering and the crops wouldn't grow or maybe the deer left or the turkey left, we would know that it's a sign from our creator saying, We've had enough. We are not no longer allowed to have the gift of that animal or crop. So, but luckily that never happened. Now we'd use all the pieces. So if we were able to maybe hunt a bear or defend ourselves from a bear, we'd be able to use that pelt or that animal skin as a blanket because it has such thick fur. The skin itself is very thick instead of this little thin piece of deer skin that you may have seen in your life at some point. So that would be used as our blankets instead of our clothing. Or we could use other pieces of the bear as well. We could use its claws to make our jewelry. So I have a bear claw necklace here for you now that this is a sign of being a warrior because it means I defended myself from a bear attacking, or maybe I hunted a bear to defend our village. So this is a sign of being a warrior that our warriors would have worn to maybe intimidate our opponents in the battlefield. We have our porcupine quills that are very heavily used in our society as well. We use them to make our Maybe our roaches, our headdresses, like I'm wearing for you today. We can make what we call porky bags or porky carrying cases that we use porcupine quills in through a, um, through a stitching, almost like sewing, and it creates some kind of bag or container. And then we have our feathers as well. I'm wearing several for you today, and I have my turkey feather fan over here for you to see. So our turkey feathers are very medicinal for us. We use them to pray or during ceremony. We believe that if someone's having bad, bad spirits, bad thoughts, we could just dust their shoulder, almost like a knighting ceremony, very quick one, dusting their shoulder, and that would help alleviate some of those maybe bad spirits or bad juju or whatever else term you might use for that. And then when we have our sacred fire going, as that smoke is rising to our ancestral lands and to the creator, we may pray to the smoke. 
so that that smoke and that fire will carry our thoughts, our prayers, or our words to our ancestral lands. So that is another reason why we use our turkey feathers. Now there's a very big difference between the turkey feathers on my fan, the turkey feathers on the back of my headdress, and the special feather on the top of my head. I bet you can guess what type of feather it is. It is an eagle feather. It is an eagle feather. So the eagle was a very important animal to us. The eagle is the bird that flies highest in the sky. And we believe that our ancestral lands are in that sky with our creator and all of our ancestors watching over us. So the eagle flies closest to them. So we use them almost as like a, a telephone to go towards our ancestral lands. So we'll typically adorn our clothing, our regalia, with an eagle feather on the top as that badge of honor. Now, today, in most societies and in, uh, indigenous groups, only a veteran can give away an eagle feather. Uh, so as a time of peace, where not many people are joining the military as it used to, I know when my dad was a kid, um, he was on the, um, during Vietnam, or yeah, during Vietnam, they called about 116 names or 116 birth dates to be drafted. And his, they picked like the eight days around his, but they did not pick his birthday. So luckily for that, it ended my military career before I was even born because I did not want to be the person to uh, stop that ritual of, of joining. Um, but there's a long history of Mohegan men fighting in the military. So it's a badge of honor to be able to be gifted an eagle feather. But again, with the lack of veterans coming in, it's, it's much harder to gift it. So many tribal nations are returning to, the, to it being an elder's decision to be gifting eagle feathers to its population. Now, a long time ago, if you were maybe 40, you would be thought of as an elder because the if you didn't die from hunting or disease or an accident because we didn't have hospitals you can just go to to help you, um, it was a pretty short life expectancy. And then you have your son, like Uncas, who was born in, uh, I want to get this right, 1598 and passed away in 1685. So you have the people who did live to their 90s, but most of the time you live until your 40s, 50s, or 60s, and that was pretty common. <clears throat> now you might hear me making some noise up here. I am wearing my deer hoofs. My deer hoofs. It's our ancient style of bells. So nowadays, with more modern, uh, more modern regalia, Native Americans will wear almost like metal bells around their ankles to make this type of clanging noise. Well, as northern, northeast woodland, we didn't have metal when the English landed here. When the, maybe the Sioux tribes, the Navajo nations that were out west, they were still trading in the 1800s. They were trading for metal. They were trading for muskets. And they were still living their traditional lives. So they upgraded from maybe these style of noisemakers to metal when they were still living in their teepees or living in their cabins. Um, when we met the English, it was 200 years before that, and so we kind of assimilated very quickly. We went from pretty much straight from wearing these to not wearing them at all because we were wearing more modern clothing. We weren't really wearing our regalia as much. We traded for our lightweight cotton shirts and our, and our uh, cotton pants as quick as we could because it was much easier. So that's a little bit about my attire today. This is a pretty normal a uh, piece of regalia for men in this area, in the Eastern Woodland area. Some of these pieces are more spiritual and more ceremonial than others. I wouldn't just walk around wearing a headdress because if I went into my wigwam, I would clip my eagle feather every time. I wouldn't always wear my necklace because it's very heavy and it's more ceremonial. So it'd be basically just wearing my deerskin pieces and my shirt would be pretty much what I wear on a day-to-day -day basis. <clears throat> so I want to talk to you a little bit about farming because farming is a very important piece for us. 
we pretty much lived off of our crops and off of our hunting. Now, you might have heard of a little story called the first Thanksgiving, but some of what you heard can be true, and some of what you heard might not be true. Depends on what you've been told. I don't even know the true story. I don't think anyone will ever know the true story except for those who may have lived it. Um, well, I'm not here to talk to you about Thanksgiving because that did not happen to our tribe. So we really don't know much about it. But our agriculture is what saved the lives of the Europeans coming in because most of the men and women, mostly men, who came over on the early English ships were prisoners of the English government. They were saying, hey, we're gonna risk your lives to go overseas, and if you don't make it there, then no problem with us, because you guys are prisoners. And so a lot of these people that came over, they weren't gardeners. They weren't mountain men who lived off of the, out of the jungle. They lived in the cities of England. They didn't have to fight for themselves every day. They went to the market to pick up food. They got a pig, they got a cow, they got some vegetables. They'd never lived off the earth before. So when they came here, they had no idea what they were doing. So we taught these early settlers to survive on how to grow our corn and our beans and our squash, how to trap animals like maybe foxes or porcupine or muskrats or mink uh, to trap all those smaller animals. So it's very important that we kept that first, uh, first group of European settlers alive because then we were able to be allies after that and have a friendly relationship. Now we have some teachings about our turtle shell here. You might, a lot of kids always ask, well, where's the turtle? And I have to sadly always say, well, he became turtle soup at one point. But if you ever look at the shell of an indigenous turtle to this area, you will see that there's a lot of squares on the turtle's back. And I'm going to explain to you why there's all these squares. And you can either believe me or not. That's up to you. In the very center, the very center, the biggest part of its back, there are 13 squares, 13 big squares. And if you look along the outside of the turtle shell, this last centimeter or half inch, there are 28 little smaller, what we call secutes of the turtle's back. Can anyone tell me what we might have used that as? 13 sections with 28 smaller sections? That is the exact answer. We have 13 lunar months, and every lunar month from full moon to full moon is 28 days. So this was our original calendar. We didn't have the need to have a silly song to remember how many days are in each month, because I still don't know. I can get to that, our creation story. So, again, this was our calendar. We, we might not have actually had it on the wall and say, all right, crossing off that month and crossing off that month. But we use this teachings from Grandfather Turtle to know when we can hunt deer because we kind of created the hunting seasons. Now, we may have hunted a little bit out of seasons, unlike today, where you'd probably go to jail um, for hunting a deer in the middle of summer because there's years for it or time periods for it. But we knew when we can hunt deer, when we knew when we can hunt turkey and when they're maybe, you know, raising the population or maybe... You know, burrowing animals are hunting for food at certain times or certain months of, these, of the year. And so we know when we can go and hunt those burrowing animals when they're not in, you know, in the ground sleeping or, or anything like that. So this was our original calendar. Now to answer this gentleman's question, the next story I have for you is our creation story. A long time ago, Grandfather Turtle was swimming in the ocean. At this point, the whole earth that we know of was all water. So Grandfather Turtle, one of our ancient oldest ancestors, wanted to take a little nap. So he went to the bottom of the ocean and fell asleep on the ocean floor. As the time went on, some mud stuck to his shell, some sand stuck to it, and some other muck 
slept, uh, stuck onto that turtle shell. After many centuries of sleeping at the bottom, he woke up and he realized he had to surface to the top. So he swam up to the top of the ocean to get a nice breath of fresh air. And what happens was all that mud, dirt, and gunk stuck to the back of Grandfather Turtle and was known as our first landmass called Turtle Island. So when you talk to any tribal nation in North America and Canada, they'll typically refer to North America as Turtle Island. If you ever look at the shape of the, the United States and Canada, you'll see that like Nova Scotia on the right side is the hand, then like the North Pole in the upper Canada is the head, you have Alaska as the left arm, the Baja Peninsula as the left leg, and then Florida as the right leg, and then Mexico is the little tail. So it's actually pretty cool that it's somewhat in the shape of a turtle. But that is our creation story. Now again, that's kind of hard to believe now because we know that there are other planets out there, or not planets, other countries out there. Uh, we definitely aren't moving on the back of a turtle or else I'm pretty sure that'd be a, the biggest discovery of our lifetime. Um, but this is what we taught our kids a long time ago, a long time ago. <clears throat> All right, we're doing great on time here. What was that? What do I have in my medicine bag? So that's a secret. That's a secret. It's actually connected to the mic around my neck, my neck right now. So that's where that is. But that's a good question. Now, I cannot confirm or deny this because, well, I definitely can't confirm it because who knows where you get teachings from. But I've had many people tell me that, and many elders, maybe not from the Mohegan tribe, but from other tribes, they'll say that the, a, a man or woman's medicine bag is very sacred to them. Maybe they have sage and cedar in it for when they need to make an offering or they need to burn to make a prayer. Maybe they have some flint row corn, which was our traditional corn that we ate hundreds of years ago. Doesn't look as good as our corn now, but I'm sure it tastes very good. Maybe they had some what we call yolky egg, which is almost like an oatmeal consistency. If you take your corn, and you put the kernels in a mortar and pestle and grind it up, it becomes similar to a cornmeal, which would be oatmeal. I was trying to think of that. It becomes almost like an, a dry oatmeal consistency. So when you mix that with a little water, it can become your lunch for the day. So all you need is a little couple er, uh, kernels of corn, and that will be able to feed you for a whole day because of uh, the consistency of it. <clears throat> Hmm, where was I? Where was I? After that, I was just talking about, I got excited. It was about the, anyways. Well, we'll keep on moving. That happens sometimes when I get off track and then I completely mind blank after I finish my, I, you could get me going on tangents for days. Um, I got hours and hours of information I could go into the Pequot War and other historical events for a long time, um, but I know you probably don't want to hear three hours of extra history tonight. All right. So we have our styles of music. We'll do a quick little intro about our music. I already played the drum for you. Now we do not have any traditional Mohegan songs. We have one that we have records of that lead back to the 1800s and potentially even earlier. And that is a special song that we don't really share with non-Mohegans. Most of our music has been, we've asked permission from other tribal nations to play because we just don't have our history of music. We don't have a lot of our history. A lot of our history is passed on through storytelling and teachings because, well, we kind of all know what happened during the 1700s and 1800s. We weren't allowed to practice our culture. We weren't allowed to speak our language. Thousands of Native American kids were being sent to boarding schools where they were taught to shave their head, where they were taught to not speak their language, and basically told that you guys aren't Native. Um, so we really lost several hundred years of our history. 
and we pretty much lost our language. Luckily, now we're in the middle of rebuilding it still. So our music, our music isn't really ours, but we asked permission from other tribal nations to play their music in our language. So we took their songs and we were able to translate it into our language, which is awesome. Which is why in that song, you heard me say, Wami Skidombak, um, Yo Tapio, and I use the words Nanu Yo Tapio and Okunas Yo Tapio, and that's saying, I'm welcoming everyone to an event. I'm welcoming our nonners. I'm welcoming, welcoming our grandfathers. And I'm welcoming all my relations, because that's what Wami Skitompak means. All my relations. <clears throat> and then you have, in our drum music, is not like it is like your Taylor Swift album that just popped up recently, which all the kids are loving, by the way. Our music is different. I already played one song for you today where I sang the same verse twice for you. We don't have a four minute song in the whole song. We don't have a bridge, we don't have a verse, we don't have a chorus, it's very different. So we play our music four times. Uh, everything we pretty much do is in fours. Now I played it for you twice because I wanna play more than just one song and I'm sure more hearing different types of drumming is, would be better on these short little outreaches. But outside of the drum music, we have our rattles. We have our, almost like maracas, which we could use a turtle shell, we could use rawhide to make a little uh, cup for all those hard beads or maybe uh, beans or seeds to go into to make a maraca sign of, kind of sound. And then we have our pipes, our flutes. We have our flutes. This flute is very important to me because this was gifted to my grandfather when he went on a trip to the Navajo Nation of Arizona. He was the chairman of the elders in the late 90s and early 2000s, right after we gained federal recognition. So as a chairman, he went over Indian country to learn and to maybe talk about Mohegan culture and learn about other nations. So usually on these trips, he would be given a gift and he'd leave with gifts to offer to them from our culture. Because we love sharing with other Native Americans the, difference, the differences and the similarities between our cultures. So he was gifted this. Then he gave it to me when he came back as a young kid and said, you'll be using this one day. And I said, okay, whatever, grandpa. Um, I play a saxophone, I don't play a Native American flute. And who knew, 20 years later, now I like to use it and I show it on my outreaches. So it might look like a recorder, and I'm sure some of you had kids who played the recorder in elementary school and it sounds terrible. Uh, well, I guarantee you this does not. So I'm gonna play a quick little 30 seconds here for you so you can hear the magnificent beauty that one of these bad boys can play. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> so that is just a little bit. Um, we have other men in our tribe, other women who are able to actually call themselves a, uh, a flute player. Sadly, I have, do not have the practice and the time of learning our flute just at this moment. Hopefully I can be very quickly and learn some of our songs. So this one, this last piece here, Actually, I'll teach you a little bit about science, because science is cool. So we had our pottery, what we called Shantok ware. But in the beginning, we just had our clay pottery, something that looks just like this. This is actually an exact replica of a, I wouldn't say exact, I'm sure this was made much smaller and by a completely different person. But this is a replica of one of our oldest pots that we have in our collection. We have a pot made by Martha Uncas, which is the granddaughter of Chief Uncas, 
So it was probably made sometime in the 1700s. This is what it looks like. We have our castellations here, our four castellations on the top. We have our dips, our ebbs and our flows around the outside. This is what most of our pottery would have looked like no matter who made it. We had our own style. And then we have the decorations along the side as well. So if you come to the museum, you'll see a much, much larger version of this. Also, it's pretty broken because we found it in the dirt hundreds of years after it was used, like most of our artifacts. However, we found that our pottery kept breaking. Using just clay and just water, our pots kept breaking when we went to boil food or maybe make a stew or make a soup. It just wasn't holding up to the high temperatures of our fires. So we came up somehow, couldn't tell you how, with an idea to mix our clay with our wampum, our quahog shells. So this is when our Shantok ware actually was created. Once we realized by adding pieces of this or maybe crumpled up or grounded, however, I don't know the consistency of our shell, but we'd break this up and kind of break it up a little bit and we mix it in with our clay. And that would allow our pottery to withstand a much, much higher heat. So we'd be able to leave our Shantok ware on top of an open fire for hours and not have it break or crack. Because imagine you get home or maybe in the morning you start your, um, what do you use nowadays, slow cooker. And six hours later you come home and it's cracked in the middle and your chicken that you've been cooking all day and waiting for just fell on your counter. It'd be pretty upsetting, especially when you have a limited source of food. So being able to use our quahog shell, our wampum, infused with our pottery, created our own version of pottery that is still kind of like a marvel today to, to a lot of um, ancient, study, uh, ancient studies. So that's pretty awesome. All right, lastly, because I do want to save some time for questions, um, I'll tell you, talk to you about our toys. Because yes, we had toys too. Now, a long time ago, we were very env environmentally friendly, like I've been talking about. So we made sure we used naturally pieces, natural pieces that we could find in the wilderness. So after all the kids shucked all the ears of corn that we'd eat for almost every meal, the kids could then use those corn husks to make little dolls. Corn husk dolls is actually one of the widest used type of toy throughout most indigenous nations all over the United States and Canada, except for probably a lot of Canadian tribes that lived in the snow and tundra, because that'd be very difficult with no ground. So we have our corn husk dolls. Now we're able to manipulate the corn husks. If they were too dry, we could wet them and mold them and maybe put some string around it to form little arms and legs and a head. Or we could just make a simple one and we could braid the corn husks, just like the ones in this little lady's arms here. So we could braid it as well. We use those corn husks because it's something if we wanted to either, if they got old and raggedy, we could either burn it or we could leave it in the woods and it would disintegrate in maybe a couple days. It wouldn't create some kind of litter, which would be awesome. We then leveled up, or at the same time, we made our wishbone dolls. So we used the wishbones from turkeys, again, something you can get after you, you get the food from the turkey, you get the feathers from the turkey, uh, you get some other tools from other bones, and then you get to use these as well. So we have our little wishbone. You can kind of actually see the bottom on this one right here. So we have our old style regalia, our animal skins. And then we have our more contemporary with our cloths, our fabrics, and our beadwork. So we make little wishbone dolls with just a little couple pieces of fabric, which is pretty cool. So this is what we'd use to teach our kids. This is how we'd use our storytelling. If you've ever seen or been to the Mohegan Pow Wow, we have an elder uh, named Betty Jean who will use modern day toys to kind of talk through her stories. And she has hundreds of stories. 
So she'd always, every year, she brings her basket of maybe like a, a Tigger doll, and they'll bring all these other dolls and little stuffed animals to kind of talk about her teachings. And now in modern time, we took a Barbie doll and made our own little Gladys Tanaquidgen regalia for a more modern type of toy. So we can still do this. As long as you're able to craft, you can see some pretty intricate beadwork for such a small piece on a doll. So I'm sure this came with its own accessories and its own hairbrush and whatever else Barbies come with. I clearly don't know what Barbies come with. I've never played with them. But we can still make these to kind of teach our ancient stories with our more modern toys, which is pretty awesome. My name is David Eichelberg. Uh, I'm the Outreach and Tradition Specialist from the Mohegan Tribe, and we are here at the LaGrua Center in Stonington, Connecticut. Uh, I've been doing this job for about six months. Uh, it entails not just you know, going out to schools and, and businesses or, or places like this, museums, and teaching about culture, but it's also, I'm, uh, there's a traditional aspect where I'm you know, supposed to learn traditional things, whether it's leatherworking or beadworking or maybe teaching a uh, drum group or teaching uh, men how to dance. It kind of encompasses a little bit everything about the cultural side of our Mohegan tribe. So this job really has helped me understand the best way to teach about native culture. Because there's always different perspectives, like with everything. Um, if, we're if we're looking at the 1630s, where Uncas um, our first chief Uncas uh, split from the Pequot tribe and created Mohegan. You know, you have the, the, the uh, perspective from the Mohegan, which, you know, we, we love Uncas. He's our, he's our chief. You know, you have the perspective of the Pequots who, who um, you know, from their perspective, he was banished several times because he was vying for power of the Pequot tribe. He wanted to be chief. Then you have the English uh, perspective where he's like, this guy is, you know, he's, he's our guy, he wants to be our friend, so we're going to let that go for as long as, as long as he's our friend, we're going to uphold our relationship with him. And then you have the Dutch, who, who was on the side of the Pequots um, when the animosity turned. So with all these different perspectives, there's no really one right story. Um, now, some of those may differ, where, you know, we have our own opinion, maybe some of the history is a little bit different from tribe to tribe, and that's perfectly okay. Um, you can't fix what happened 400 years ago. You know, if one person tells two people something of a history, and they tell their generation, they tell their generation, that's at some point, that's two completely different stories. So it's hard to have a history when we didn't have history books before the 1650s, you know? It's just some things, most of what you read today comes from the English point of view, which can be skewed in some ways. So my experience doing the uh, offering my program or the Mohegan Tribal program of the outreach uh, has been pretty awesome so far. You know, schools love it, where we, uh, you know, we go from all the way from first grade all the way to seniors in high school. We could even do uh, colleges. We do, you know, we can go to any business who is, who's looking for a little bit of teaching uh, kind of like that. We even do, um, you know, weekly meetings. So if you're a, uh, a lions meeting, uh, you can, we can, we, I do that as well. Um, political meetings, uh, town hall meetings, anything like that. I'm always, you know, can be available for it. Um, it's been pretty great. Uh, you know, people love to learn about it. People are always fascinated about the uh, Native American culture and Mohegan, since we are in, in this land of, of the area that the Mohegans were hundreds of years ago and still are to this day. Coming to the museum is an awesome uh, experience. Uh, it is the oldest owned and operated native museum in North America. Uh, so that's awesome feat for us. You know, it was built in 1931 uh, and it's still going on to this day. We had our 90th anniversary in, in 2021, kind of in the middle of COVID. Uh, so it was a very small event, but it was still a very good event, especially being after being stuck in our house for over, over a year. Um, it's, a, it's a very small museum, but it's packed with artifacts. Uh, what, our medicine woman, Gladys Tantikwijan, uh, she collected half of these, or even 
80% of our artifacts in her travels across the world through, uh, through United States, through Canada, from the East Coast all the way to the West Coast. You know, she gathered materials where she either traded um, some of our pieces, you know, some of her pieces uh, that she may have made um, for other tribes' culture, other tribes' pieces um, for goodwill exchanges. Um, uh, we have some old pieces that have been dug up in our own archaeological digs. You know, we have Uncas's collar, uh, which we believe is the little neck piece he would have wore 400 years ago. Um, and we have, it, we have it dated back to at least the early 1600s, um, which is pretty awesome. We have a lot of other pieces uh, of our Shantok ware, where it's specific, where it's pottery mixed with our wampum. So little pieces of our wampum. Um, our quahog shells, and that kind of helps create the durability of high temperatures. Um, so it's cool seeing that Shantok ware that we have been able to dug up. Uh, we found uh, the stone parts of pipes, uh, you know, where you'd actually put the tobacco in. Uh, the wooden handles are gone, obviously, hundreds of years later. But seeing those stone pieces, seeing our, seeing our stone tools from hundreds of years ago is pretty cool. It is a free museum, so that's another big plus. Um, coming in, checking it out. We do have our own outdoor village as well, where we have a longhouse and a wigwam um, made very traditionally. We still use the sinew. Uh, we might use a little bit of more modern day rope um, to help move it along, but it's still the same, uh, you know, poplar bark, uh, same tree trunks we would have used hundreds of years ago. Um, and then we also have our, you know, our ancient foods that we would have grown back then, our, our, our gourds, our corns, beans, and squash. Um, some, we don't grow as much, as much fruit because that would, it's a little bit more time consuming and you know, we're only there five days a week so it'd be hard to work with fruit as much. Um, but it's pretty awesome. We have our, you know, a little bit of a stockade fence so you kind of get the feeling of what it would have been like living inside one of these villages uh, a long time ago. So what inspired me to take this job was really growing up as a kid, you know, going to tribal meetings, uh, learning from my grandfather, who was a chairman of the elders at that time, uh, really soaking in everything where my parents, you know, made me go to functions. They made me learn some bits of language. They made me, I, I drummed with my dad for, you know, over a decade, um, learning all these things growing up and having other elders say, learn what you can now, but we need you to get educated so you can come back and further help the tribe. So I went, I left, you know, I, I wasn't very far, I was still home, but going to Central Connecticut State, going to Southern New Hampshire, uh, going to Mitchell College here in New London through my uh, educational career, I was, that was my most needed thing was to focus on school. So I wasn't really going to events, I wasn't able to learn during those years. But, you know, I got my education, I went out and did a, what you call more of a normal job. Um, out in the world working with the Connecticut Sun and then something just triggered that I wanted to give back now I didn't want to wait anymore so I, I, I looked for positions that were opening up and the outreach position was just right up my alley uh, so one thing I'd like to advertise is just our museum I, I can't advertise that enough every time I'm on an outreach I will always advertise that to get you know students to get uh, adults uh, senior citizens at any age uh, to come and visit um, we are open Tuesdays through Fridays from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then starting in May, we will have our Saturday hours as well uh, from the same time, 10 to 3. So that way, when people are in school or people are in work, they still have that day to come over. Um, you know, on Saturdays, we are planning to have small events there where maybe if you are there, you get a little glimpse of, you know, what we might be doing that day. You know, some type of um, traditional piece there. Uh, it is a free museum like we said earlier. Um, so if you'd like to leave a donation for the museum, we always accept that, but we would never charge anyone uh, to, to learn about things that we were taught for free, because uh, we, we just don't believe in that. So we do want to give off that free education for people at the museum. Okay, I'll be back in about 10 minutes. Okay. Sounds good. Um, not too long ago, even in the 2010s, it, my job was more of a, uh, you know, you offered your time for free, a volunteer position. So maybe it was the elders or maybe it was the cultural department who would say, hey, we're looking for a couple people to go to a school on this day. Who is available? And they would send that out to like the whole, um, the whole membership. 
And so they just hopefully a couple of people would say yes. If not, we'd have to say no to that. So my dad was one of those volunteers. A couple of the elders who taught me most of my culture were some of those volunteers going to different schools. Also learning that uh, my th three times great grandfather, Lemuel Fielding, who was chief uh, from 1903 to 1928, he was also kind of one of the first outreach specialists where he was going to Hartford and teaching uh, a certain school a lot about our culture every year. Uh, so going working with those students in Hartford, um, he was kind of the original one. So I wanted to take over that responsibility, which has been an honor so far.